pleasure to be here and a real honor to be speaking to you under the auspices of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. As a theater critic, and more recently, as Steve mentioned, a playwright and an opera librettist, I can say that in a very real sense, Western civilization is my business. Theater, from Sophocles and Euripides to Broadway and the West End, has always been part of the heart of what it means to be civilized. And the fact that I cover the oldest of the performing arts for the Wall Street Journal is, to my mind, the most honorable of cultural pursuits. I am additionally fortunate in that the journal encourages me to cover live theater from coast to coast. In fact, a Florida newspaper once dubbed me America's drama critic, which is coming at a bit high, but isn't entirely without meaning, because I am, in truth, the only drama critic for a national publication who routinely attends and reviews theater performances, not just in New York, but all over America. It is the best job in the world, except for the part where I have to sit in airports. And it puts me in an exceptionally good position, I think, to speak to you about the future of theater. To talk about the future, one must start by talking about the present. And in many ways, theater in America today is thriving. I follow the activities of roughly 250 professional theater companies in America. Each year, I review 100 shows, 50 of them in New York City and 50 of them in other cities. And when I sit down each season and make a list of shows that I want to see in places other than New York, I don't want for places to go. So far this year, I have been to the following cities, uh, and it's not a complete list, but I have reviewed shows in Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Sarasota, Florida, Washington, D.C., Fort Myers, Florida, Ashland, Oregon, Westport, Connecticut, Agunquit, Maine, Lenox, Massachusetts, Peterborough, New Hampshire, Madison, New Jersey, Garrison, New York, New Hope, Pennsylvania, and Spring Green, Wisconsin. Like Johnny Cash, I've been everywhere. So yes, there's lots of theater in America, and much of it, maybe most of it, is good, very often exceptionally so. But is it healthy? That is a different question and a more disturbing one. The men and women who run every theater company in America are painfully aware that fewer Americans are buying tickets to their performances, fewer and older. Anyone who goes to the theater nowadays knows what it feels like to sit among a sea of bald and gray heads. Even such technologically up-to-date enterprises as the closed-circuit opera telecasts transmitted from New York's Metropolitan Opera House to movie theaters across America draw crowds consisting mainly of senior citizens. We live in a world where most people under the age of 50 don't know who Chekhov and Shaw and Tennessee Williams and Horton Foote and August Wilson were, and where many teachers either refuse to admit or are afraid to say that it's important to know their names. Now, America as a whole has never been an old-fashioned European-style culture. We are a popular culture, one in which high culture is capable of thriving under the right circumstances, but in which it will never be dominant. Most Americans have always looked to popular culture rather than high art to help bring meaning to their lives. For the most part, we prefer sitcoms to Shakespeare, video games to great novels, hip-hop to chamber music. But there was a time when the mass media provided a countervailing influence to that preference by making high art part of their total cultural package, and that doesn't happen anymore. What I have called the middle brown moment is over, both in the mass media and among the intellectuals. It used to be that our elites didn't take popular culture seriously, but more and more it seems that they don't take anything else seriously. And one sign of that change is that the mass media in America have largely withdrawn their attention from the fine arts, theater very much included. But the fact is that live theater is no longer part of the vital center, the conversation in American culture. It is taught less often and less well in the public schools. It is rarely performed or talked about on network television, 
and perhaps most consequentially, it is written about much less often in newspapers and magazines. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I had occasion to review the New York premiere of Me, Myself, and I, Edward Albee's latest play. I remarked in my review that Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was the only one of Mr. Albee's 30 plays to have made an enduring impression on the general public. Indeed, it's possible that Virginia Woolf could be the last American play of any kind to have made such an impression. Now, a number of readers of the Wall Street Journal wrote to me about that observation, and their reactions can be boiled down into a one-word reply. Really? So I gave it some additional thought, and the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I had inadvertently put my finger on something that is of relevance not just to Edward Albee's career, but to the increasingly shaky standing of high culture in postmodern America. Now, it is true that a number of plays that have come along since Virginia Woolf opened on Broadway in 1962, including Tony Kushner's Angels in America, John Patrick Shanley's Doubt, Tracy Letts's August Osage County and Lynn Nottage's Ruined, did manage to stir up a fair amount of talk among the chattering classes. But were any of them ever talked about in the way that Virginia Woolf or Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman or Tennessee Williams's A Streetcar Named Desire were and still are talked about? If so, it's escaped my notice. A half century after the fact, it is easy to forget that the controversy that greeted the premiere of Virginia Woolf, which in 1962 was thought by many Americans to be frank to the point of obscenity, actually made Edward Albee famous. How famous? Enough so that Johnny Carson invited him onto The Tonight Show four years later to promote his latest play, A Delicate Balance. I know this because he shared the Carson couch with Duke Ellington, about whom I wrote a biography. Not long after that, Life magazine published a lengthy, lavishly illustrated profile of Albee. In the 60s, you couldn't get much more famous than that. To be sure, Albee's ascent into the stratosphere of renown had been fueled by the fact that Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor starred in Mike Nichols' 1966 film version of Virginia Woolf. But long before that film was released, Albee was already much more widely known than any present-day American playwright. Indeed, Life had previously devoted a three-page spread to the Virginia Woolf in 1962, declaring its author to be one of America's most gifted and jolting playwrights. Back then, the national media still devoted a considerable amount of time and space to covering high culture. Even if you didn't live in New York, you could still read a review of an important play in a weekly news magazine like Time or Newsweek, watch a scene from the play being performed by the original cast on The Ed Sullivan Show on Sunday night, or see the author being interviewed on Tonight or Today. Moreover, wire service coverage of big city cultural events was routinely carried by local newspapers throughout the country. As a result, it was possible well into the 70s for a high culture artist to become known to the American public at large. Beverly Sills, for instance, made the cover of Time in 1971, and Mikhail Baryshnikov was a full-fledged media idol within a few months of his 1974 defection from the Soviet Union. No more. The national media mostly stopped covering high culture. Nowadays, they're besotted by Hollywood, which means that it is no longer possible for an artist like Beverly Sills or Edward Albee to win true fame. You tell me, who was the last American poet to become famous in the household word sense? Robert Frost. The last choreographer? Jerome Robbins. The last visual artist? Andy Warhol. Moreover, such celebrity-making mechanisms as still exist, no longer have the power to universally declare an artist, unilaterally declare an artist, worthy of renown. Yes, Jonathan Franzen was on the cover of Time five years ago, but how many people who hadn't read any of his novels could have told you who he was? That is the acid test of fame, 
and it is no longer accessible to high culture artists. Today, only pop culture matters. And is that so bad? What, after all, does a serious artist get out of being famous other than money and distraction? Did Truman Capote benefit from becoming a too familiar face, or was his career, and indeed his life, shortened as a result of his celebrity? Those are fair questions, and they cannot be answered simply. On the other hand, I'm sure that it can't be good for high culture when none of its practitioners is known outside a tight little circle of connoisseurs. I wonder, how many Americans discovered live theater a half century ago because they happened to read about Edward Almby in Life magazine or see him on The Tonight Show? And how many of their grandchildren will fail to make such life-changing discoveries because those opportunities have dried up? Now, I hasten to add that I don't think that pop culture doesn't deserve to be taken seriously. Speaking as the biographer of Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, I think I'm in a strong position to make a case for the excellence and the significance of the best pop culture. The problem is that a culture totally dominated by popular art is, by definition, limited. There's just more to life than getting your head blown off in a drug deal on TV and more to be said about love than can be crammed into a 32-bar ballad. A play like Tennessee Williams, a novel like Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood, a ballet like Jerome Robbins' Dances at a Gathering, paintings like Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series, musical compositions like Aaron Copeland's Piano Sonata. These are large-scale works of art that aim higher than their popular counterparts. In fact, that's not a bad, rough, and ready definition of it aims higher and tries harder. Mere ambition, mind you, is not in and of itself a good thing, any more than bigger is by definition better. But we are cheating ourselves when we direct our attention solely to less ambitious art. Man cannot and need not live by masterpieces alone, so long as he never forgets what makes them masterpieces. A masterpiece, as Louis Armstrong said of the trumpet playing of Bobby Hackett, has more ingredients. And egalitarianism be damned, it really is better. We know that, but what do we do about it? For the cold, hard fact is that we must now make a case for the fine arts, theater very much among them. Throughout most of Western history, it would never have occurred to anyone to feel the need to do that. The essential importance of the fine arts was taken for granted by all civilized human beings. No more. We must make ordinary people believe once again in the importance of theater, and we cannot do it simply by telling them that they should. They must be persuaded, not insulted. And in my experience, you don't persuade people to come to plays by telling them that they're dumb if they don't. That's the entitlement mentality, and we all know where that leads. So instead of waiting for a new generation of Americans to stumble across theater on their own, we're going to have to bring it to them and show them that it's worth having. And we cannot count on the mass media to help us do it. We have to do it ourselves. In the theater, in the case of theater, that effort starts by communicating to ordinary people, people who've never seen a play in a theater, what it's like to do so. Use your imagination for a moment. Imagine this. The house lights fade to black. The room falls still as an actor steps from the wings and speaks the simple words that set a plot in motion. Oh, for a muse of fire. Yes, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things up my sleeve. This play is called Our Town. Suddenly, the outside world vanishes and you're swept into a parallel universe of excitement and adventure, poetry and magic, fear and hope. That's what it feels like to go to the theater and see a great play. But when did you last <coughs> do so? A week ago? A year? Or do you now prefer to stay home and watch cable television or use Netflix to stream a movie? If so, 
you are one of the reasons why live theater is in trouble. Take a look at the National Endowment for the Arts' survey of public participation in the arts, the most statistically reliable study of its kind. It tells us that not only did non-musical play attendance drop to 8.3% from 12.3% of U.S. adults between 2002 and 2012, but attendance at musicals also fell to 15.2% from 17.1%, the first time the latter figure had declined since 1985. And that is really bad news. Musical comedy has always been live theater's bread and butter, the ever popular fare that never fails to fill the seats. If fewer people want to see Fiddler on the Roof or The Lion King, then the pillars that hold up American theater are crumbling. Now, a big part of the problem for New Yorkers is the horrifically high price of tickets to Broadway shows. But 63% of all Broadway tickets are bought by spendthrift tourists. Fortunately, off-Broadway and regional theater seats don't cost nearly so much. I just saw, two weeks ago, a play in Boston, the Lyric Stage Company's superb revival of Katori Hall's Saturday night, Sunday morning, for which tickets ranged from $31 to $65. By contrast, the top ticket price for Broadway's Book of Mormon is a whopping $299. And the vast majority of professional stage productions, both in New York and in the rest of America, are presented by not-for-profit theaters like Lyric Stage. These companies, of which there are about 1,800, mounted 14,600 shows in the 2010-11 season, as opposed to 118 commercial productions on Broadway and elsewhere. Yet these companies also view the NEA's bad news numbers with alarm, and they're not embarrassed to tell you that. Even at the top tier resident regional companies, subscription income, which is still considered the most reliable yardstick of a resident company's economic health, is much weaker. Adjusting for inflation, it has plummeted 13.7% since 2008. What's going wrong with theater? It's not a matter of quality control. I've been reviewing performances from coast to coast since 2004, and I continue to be impressed by what I see. Instead, what I am hearing from regional artistic directors is that they're being slammed by the on-demand mentality. In 2004, the iPod was a novelty, and tablet computers were a dream. Now, we take for granted that we can see whatever we want, whenever and wherever we want to see it, be it Grand Illusion or the Kardashians. Is there a demonstrable link between our fast-growing taste for on-demand entertainment and the plight of live theater? As yet, there's no definitive proof, but there's no question about the rise of the on-demand mentality, nor any doubt that theater's audience share is declining relative to that of other art forms that are accessible via the new media. Let's go back and look again at the NEA survey. It tells us that a generational shift is occurring. Young people are much more likely to use the new media to consume art of all kinds. The NEA reports, for instance, that 6.6% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 use handheld or mobile devices to read, listen to, or download novels, short stories, or plays versus just 2.5% between the ages of 55 and 64. But along the way, live theater is getting left in lurch. Very few Americans use the new media to watch plays. While 61% of all adults use TV, radio, or the internet to access art or arts programming, only 7% view stage plays or musicals on the electronic media. Disaggregate those numbers and the tendency is even clearer. 16% of all U.S. adults are using the new media to read fiction, as opposed to 3.4% who do so to view theater or dance performances. The bottom line, I think, is clear. The idea that you might voluntarily go out at night to see a half dozen human beings act out a story in person, much less 
that you would commit in advance to doing so at a specific hour on a specific day is now alien to most Americans, especially younger ones. So how can drama companies combat this stay-at-home mindset? Many of them, I'm sorry to say, have responded to the crunch by opting for safer programming, heavy on comedies and recent Broadway hits, much lighter on classical revivals. More encouragingly, PBS is just about to launch a series called On Stage in America that will be devoted to actual regional theater productions taped in performance. I think that's a wonderful idea. But on the other hand, I don't know whether watching a play on TV will ever persuade a significant number of viewers to go out and see one in person for the first time. Because the theatrical experience is unique unto itself. It is radically different from watching a movie or even an HD simulcast. People who go to the theater regularly take that difference, the immediate physical presence of flesh and blood actors for granted. Yet, it's the main reason why old-fashioned, low-tech live theater is still and will always be worth seeing, even in the age of Netflix. So how do we get people to come see it? The trick, I believe, is to treat this seeming paradox not as a problem, but as a marketing opportunity, something that can be sold. Of all the shows I've seen throughout America in the past few years, one of the half dozen that I remember most vividly was a production of Connor McPherson's Port Authority that was presented in Glencoe, a suburb of Chicago, by Writers Theater, one of America's finest drama companies. It was mounted in the smaller of Writers Theater's two performing spaces, a 56-seat theater located in the back room of a bookstore. The set was three chairs. The cast consisted of three Chicago actors, no stars, who played a trio of unhappy Irishmen. Nobody pulled any guns, nobody chased anyone else around the room. All that happened was that the men told their stories in a relaxed, natural way that soon became so intense that you could all but hear your own heart beating. At no time were they more than a pebble toss away from the members of the audience. Sometimes they even stepped off that tiny stage and spoke their lines in the aisles. You can't stream that on an iPad. Writer's Theater is justly celebrated for the thrilling intimacy of its productions. <coughs> Five years ago, I saw David Cromer's staging of A Streetcar Named Desire in the company's 108 seat house. My seat was eight feet from the bed on which Stanley Kowalski raped Blanche Dubois. Michael Halberstam, the company's artistic director, likes to joke that the motto of the company ought to be Writer's Theater. Did you get any on you? <laughs> <laughs> Yet there are many other first rank U.S. theater companies, including Chicago's Court and Timeline Theaters, <coughs> Florida's Palm Beach Drama Works, off Broadway's classic stage company in the Irish Repertory Theater, the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, and Wisconsin's American Players Theater that give some or all of their performances in spaces of comparable size. Indeed, most not-for-profit companies in America perform in houses with fewer than 500 seats. Why then don't more of these companies make the up-close and personal side of theater central to their marketing. Writer's Theater does. As it says on the company's website, Writer's Theater prides itself on creating the most intimate theatrical experience possible. But the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey is the only one of the other companies I just mentioned that makes a similar claim on its website. Now that intimacy label has worked so well for Writer's Theater that the company is about to open a $28 million two-theater complex, one whose modest-sized performing spaces, 99 and 250 seats, will allow it, says Mr. Halberstam, to keep on doing what we're already doing, only better. So why aren't other companies that do the same thing embracing it as a brand? A regional theater that presents top-class local actors, directors, and designers in a small house is the high culture counterpart 
of those hugely fashionable little farm-to-table restaurants that serve slow food to locavores. Is there any reason why live theater can't be given the same spin? Call it snob appeal if you like, but it has the advantage of being true. <laughs> Yet rather than boast about their smallness, most U.S. theater companies, it seems to me, <coughs> try to sweep it under the rug. That's a mistake. Unlike the film and TV, theater is a luxury object, but one that ordinary middle class people can still afford. Above all, live theater is not a mass medium. It is a small scale, handmade art form. Intimacy is what makes it special. I believe that the power of theater is rooted, above all things, in the fact that in our secular age, it offers a secular opportunity for us to engage in what religious people call a communion of souls, a chance to come together in an intimate yet public space and engage in the collective act of watching a drama of high significance played out by men and women who share that space with us, who breathe the air we breathe, and who tell us of the timeless truths that continue to shape our lives right now. Roger Scruton, the philosopher, said something in a book called Culture Counts, Faith and Feeling in a World Besieged, that I think is worth mentioning in this connection. In this book, Scruton observes that many educators in America and England are angry at the traditional works of our culture, seeing them as mere survivals of patriotic, patriarchal, aristocratic, bourgeois, or theocratic attitudes that no longer have a claim on us. To their cry of rage, he offers the following retort. Only a very shallow reading of Chaucer or Shakespeare would see those writers as endorsing the societies in which they lived, or would overlook the far more important fact that their works hold mankind to the light of moral judgment and examine, with all the love and all the pity that it calls for, the frailty of human nature. It is precisely the aspiration towards universal truth, towards a God's eye perspective on the human condition that is the hallmark of Western culture. I quote Mr. Scruton at length because I couldn't say it better myself. Now, all the lively arts do this, but classic theater, it seems to me, is in a particularly privileged position because of its universal accessibility and perpetual relevance. Recall, if you will, what happens in King Lear. A half-senile patriarch signs away his property to a pair of greed-crazed daughters who throw him out of the house as soon as the ink dries on the deeds of trust. Stunned, he loses his mind, shortly followed by his life. Didn't you hear about that on the news just the other day? It never fails to astonish me when Shakespeare's plays are dismissed as irrelevant, insufficiently cutting edge, or even horror of horrors conservative. To see as much Shakespeare as I do, and I've reviewed 16 productions of King Lear in the last decade, is to realize that there has never been an artist who was more relevant in the sense that his work lends itself to a multiplicity of up-to-the-minute treatments. Now, I very much doubt that Shakespeare will ever vanish completely from our stages just as I doubt that the fundamental desire of human beings to experience art in one another's company is in imminent danger of dying out altogether. But those who seek to bring those human beings together to experience art must find new ways of meeting the challenge of offering potential audience members an appealing artistic experience that is significantly different in kind from what they can obtain at home. At the same time, they must also find effective new ways to spread the word about the availability and desirability of these experiences. And if they fail? Well, there will never be a world without the fine arts, which speak to the deep-seated longing for beauty in the soul of man. But it is hard to imagine what the fine arts might be like if eager men and women no longer gather in groups to experience their life-transforming power. A world without audiences would be a world denuded of one of the things that makes art an act of self-transcendence, a way of embracing the world 
and its myriad possibilities. I believe with all my heart in the permanent significance and life-changing power of the masterpieces of Western art, but it isn't enough simply to shelve them in libraries, hang them in museums, listen to them through headphones, or watch them on tablets. Except for the reading of fiction, the experience of art has always been a fundamentally social phenomenon, one that brings human beings together and encourages them to submerge their differences in the shared pursuit of joy and understanding. Therein lies an essential part of the meaning of art, a part that is now at risk, and our job is to save it. A museum full of beautiful paintings, whose galleries are empty of people, is no longer a museum. It's a warehouse or a mausoleum. And an empty theater is worse than that. It is a nightmare. A symbol of cultural disaster is potent and fearful as an empty church. It strikes me that at bottom, we should be looking to turn the diversity argument on its head. A truly diverse culture is one that respects and supports both high art and pop culture. Our problem is not that cable TV crime dramas and Broadway musicals are somehow inherently bad, but that too many people don't know that there's anything else out there. And that is the most important part of our job, not to tell and retell horror stories, but to convincingly celebrate the unique and essential glories of high art. Our Shakespeare festivals do that every summer. More often than not, I'm amazed by how their actors and directors keep on thinking of imaginative new ways to remind the rest of us that Shakespeare's plays, like all the true classics of Western art, are permanently contemporary and permanently necessary. That's our strongest card. So long as we keep in mind that we cannot assume that our cause is entitled to succeed. Instead of assuming that we're right and that other people should know it, we must make the case for art of all kinds, day after day after day. And we, who are part of the world of theater, must lead the charge. Thank you.